The armed forces are well known for their heroics in wartime, but they also play a crucial role closer to home. Right now, up and down the country, military helicopter crews are standing by to help those in distress. For more than 50 years, those teams have been run by the RAF and the Royal Navy, but the UK's search and rescue services are being privatised. To mark the end of the military's involvement, we've been looking at the valuable role they play. One of the more impressive things on display in the hangar is this. But is it a boat or is it a plane? Well, in fact, it is both. This is a Sunderland flying boat, and it was nicknamed the Porcupine by the Germans because of all the guns sticking out of it. Well, with me here is Carl Warner, who's a historian at the museum. It's extraordinary in here, and it's also so tinny, isn't it? It is. I mean, it's, you know, it's got to be built to be light, so you don't want huge chunks of metal in here. What role did the Sunderland play? The Sunderland, as a flying boat, was part of RAF Coastal Command. So that's the part of the RAF that's responsible for guarding, essentially, the sea lanes that are coming into the UK and, of course, all over the world in, in the British Empire. Particularly in the Second World War, of course, its most important role was during the Battle of the Atlantic, um, when it was a submarine hunter. So Sunderlands would be flying for you know, huge swathes of the ocean, looking for submarines, and when they found them, they would attack them with depth charges, bombs, and, of course, their machine guns. If it was being used to attack submarines from above, why did it need to be like a boat as well? Why did it need to be able to land on the water? Well, the other um, important uh, role that it had was as a, an air-sea rescue craft. Um, Sunderland's rescued crews of, of ships. They rescued uh, downed airmen, so airmen from other aircraft that, that parachuted into the sea. Um, and, of course, they had to get onto the ocean in order to do that. And it really does, when you're in it, it really does feel like you're, you're in a boat, doesn't it? I mean, you've even got, you've got your kitchen here, which obviously was packed away. Let's gonna, can we go and have a look sure. down here? Because the size, you can't really appreciate the size from in here. It feels very cramped. I mean, the noises when you're just walking through here are extraordinary. What it must have been like, though, to be flying here, be flying up in the air? Yeah, um, cold, deafening. The crews, there were a ten, ten men crew, um, usually. Could be even more people if they'd rescued some downed airmen or some uh, sailors. Um, and they very much thought, thought of themselves almost like a, the crew of a ship as much as the crew of an aircraft because they were up for so long. One Sunderland captain said that you know, they had three enemies, the weather, the sea and the Germans, and it was in that order. And so it's quite an environment to fly and fight in, let alone you know, um, be up there for that long. Amazing to have this, this flying boat on show here at Duxford. How, how did it come to be here? It's got one of the more interesting acquisition stories in that um, after it was in RAF service, it was with the French armed forces. And then it was actually beached in France and used as a bar stroke nightclub. A nightclub? So, yeah, so all of this, this fit was taken out to make room for the bar, to make room for all the accoutrements of the bar. And then, of course, after that, when the bar closed, it was brought to the Imperial War Museum. Well, they must have had some good parties in here. Lovely to see it. Thank you very much for showing us around. Thank you.